Well, this is Current Yield Grant's Interest Rate Observer of the Air. I'm Jim Grant, and with me, as always, is the great Deputy Editor of Grants, Evan Lorenz. And uh, we have two guests today. We have um, Lee Gehring and Adam Rosenzweig, who, as every reader of Grant's knows, are um, uh, the most learned and money-making commodity people in the world of stuff. And we're going to talk to them in just one moment. Adam, I have, um, and Lee, and... Uh, Evan, I've got something to tell you about. Do you guys um, look for DelanceyPlace.com in the morning? This is a uh, something that comes in every morning to my inbox, and it is a like a 1,500-word selection from a book. So the people at Delancey Place pick out a book. It couldn't be published uh, 15 years ago, but they pick out something. And this one is on asteroids. And I thought, how apropos of risk management. And they go into, uh, you'll be happy or relieved, perhaps, to know that asteroids in their uh, platitude vary inversely with their size. So the smaller they are, the more profuse. So the one meter variety is like uh, tens, hundreds of millions, and then the uh, five meter variety is like uh, tens of millions, and the, the big mothers, no, that's not the technical term, the rather 20 meter ones are like in the, um, in the millions, and the really, really big ones you don't even ask about. But reading this, I, th- I thought to myself, how wonderful that NASA instituted um, something called the uh, Center for Near-Earth Object Studies in the wake of, uh, of a 1994 event in which the Shoemaker-Levy 9 asteroid smashed into Jupiter, or pieces of it did, one explosion resulting in a blast the size of the planet Earth. So the Fed, you know, is doing this pathetic risk management stuff, but NASA is guarding us against uh, an Earth-enveloping explosion. Who do you want to do your risk management, right? So. Why isn't NASA looking at the repo market? All right, that's 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 Good all I got, there, Jim. No, it's not all I got. Lee, welcome, and uh, Adam, welcome, uh, Evan again. Well, and um, so um, uh, Adam uh, Rosenzweig and Lee Gehring are one of the uh, of Grant's uh, readers' uh, greatest assets. I mean, certainly the, Evan and I count them to be some of our closest, fastest, and most helpful friends in the entire uh, in the entire. Grant's Rolodex. And I'm going to read you a couple of headlines over Grant's pieces, and you will recall these, and perhaps you are the richer for them. One is up with the uninvestable. And I think it was Lee who told me just how bullish is the word uninvestable. And as you may recall, this is a story about the opportunities and energy. And I think there was one that followed up on that. It was investing in the uninvestable. No, in 2020. So um, this is just a couple of them. And uh, Lee, over the course of his, uh, yeah, long, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah, long career. That's right. You got to work with that, Lee. Long career has said such things as the price of gold is going to go to $2,500 an ounce. Now, this is not, it's, in fact, it seems far-fetched even today because gold is, is rather, should we say, controversial and is slightly doggy in the past few years. But um, it certainly was audacious in 1997? Uh, 2000. 2007. 2000, okay. Well, was that near the brown bottom when... Uh, uh, the, the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer of the of, uh, UK sold the last remnants of the British gold stock. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. That was 1997. 1997, and uh, it's so interesting because you brought up that article, Jim, investing in the uninvestable, probably the last great uninvestable asset class before oil over the last three or four years was gold in the late 1990s, yeah. early 2000s. And why? Because the European Central Banks were selling it, and there were people running around that if they European central bank sell five, six hundred tons a year, it's going to take them 50 to 60 years to liquidate their holdings. And gold, but never the way we measure it because of that selling, gold had never, ever been priced cheaper. And of course, it's interesting since it's bottom 1999, 2000, even to this day, it's the best performing asset class that there is. Yeah. It's, it's beaten yeah. the stock market. Well, but what we want to do today, ladies and gentlemen, is to, uh, uh, having introduced Lee and Adam, having established their bona fides, which to underscore are merely the best, I want to ask them about the lay of the land and commodities, and then uh, at length uh, ask them what to do about it. So, um, uh, Adam, why don't you start off and uh, you know, just take a couple of minutes and explain, if you would please, the origin of these uh, eruptions in commodity prices, which actually to some of us, students of asteroids bring to mind the Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet of July 1994. <laughs> <laughs> well, first off, Jim, thank you so much for, for having yeah, us sure, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such an honor we, to we be here. We would not have you back at this juncture, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, you know, as, as we're talking today, everybody is clearly looking towards the Ukraine and Russia as the culprit for right. higher commodity prices. But 
you know, we would argue that really the recent events have been just the catalyst to propel this sort of last leg in, in commodity price rallies. But actually, you know, this bull market has been a decade in the making and it has nothing really to do with the hostilities that we're seeing now. They're just coming at the worst possible time and exacerbating an already tight situation. But really what, what it comes down to in commodity markets pretty much across the board is a combination of very, very strong demand right. that, that people have just failed to appreciate. You know, it was only... Um, 18 months ago that consensus wisdom said that 2019 was going to be will have been the all-time peak high in global oil demand um, you know covid was raging in 2020 and most of the pundits said well that was it it'll we'll never get to that 2019 level again because of evs and lo and behold 2022 looks like it'll eclipse 2019 so that didn't take very long at all um and it's been a decade of underinvestment uh, across the commodity space. So, you know, I think that that's really coming home to roost now. And, and these geopolitical issues that, that are taking center stage are, are really just catalysts in an otherwise very, very tight commodity market. In that respect, they resemble COVID, do they not? Yeah, a little bit. You know, I think everyone felt that, that the commodity price rally of 2021 was mostly COVID related because of supply chain disruptions and the inability of, um, you know, being able to uh, have supply come back online the way they wanted to. And I think that that will have also been incorrect in, in retrospect. Well, is this uh, underinvestment you described, um, Adam Rosenzweig, does this pertain uh, to commodities besides uh, fossil fuels? It, it does. It, it pertains to copper. Uh, it pertains to gold, although people still don't really care about the gold industry right now, although I think that'll change here soon too. Um, but, you know, all forms of energy, certainly uranium, uh, it's really been, I would say, a curtailment of capital spending in real assets um, going back, depending on how you measure it, but certainly going back 10 years. Evan was remarking before on uh, your observation that uh, uh, that uh, mispriced commodities uh, uh, have the same distorting effects or some of the same distorting effects as do mispriced interest rates. In both cases, they uh, seem to uh, hasten uh, malinvestments, as the economists call them, or white elephants, as we laymen call them. Could you uh, elaborate on that thought? It seems to be very important. Sure. So, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, we've seen a massive proliferation of ESG investing and a huge... But this, this is, just define that. So that's that's uh, environmental, social, and governance. That's right. Okay. And, and, I, and I think, you know, for the most part, at least the way we look at things, that there's been a huge amount of attention on the environmental side of things. And what that really means is staying away from anything in the extractive industries and particularly anything in the hydrocarbon oil and gas business that emits carbon and instead plowing trillions, literally, uh, into uh, renewable energies, wind and solar, and then, of course, lithium ion batteries to back up the wind and solar, because as we now know, um, they don't do a great job of providing baseload power. Um, and one of the things that I think is so interesting, and, and we wrote about this in our last letter, but when you look at oil and gas and coal, they're very energy efficient sources of energy. Now, what, what do we mean by that? Well, for every unit of energy you put in to a coal fired power plant in order to mine the coal, beneficiate the coal, transport it, build the power plant and burn it, you generate 30 usable units of power out the other side. And basically the same is true of natural gas. Uh, the same is true, more or less, of, of oil as well. When you go down to wind and solar, you're talking about, depending on exactly how you define it, uh, which is probably a topic for another day, but anywhere basically around between three to one and five to one. So for one unit of energy you put in, you get three to five units of energy out the other side. That's a massive degradation. And the question is, how have we allowed that to happen? And what I think the answer is, is cheap energy. We've had a huge distorting impact because of cheap energy. In the same way, um, as I know your readers and listeners uh, know very, very well, that missed price interest rates lead to huge malinvestment. Mispriced energy prices, because we've had record low energy prices for the last decade, have led to a proliferation of technologies that are energy hungry, that are energy hogs. Um, and so I think that that's really, really explains a lot of, of what's happening. How happened. did these low energy prices come about? We know how uh, artificially low interest rates came to be. Uh, the Fed put them there to a degree, certainly at the short end of the yield curve. But what, what was the source of uh, these persistently cheap uh, gas and oil prices? In the hydrocarbon business and oil and gas, it was the shale revolution. Yeah. And it, it, don't underestimate what the shale revolution did to the global hydrocarbon industry that is natural gas and oil over the last 
it's almost 20 years because the first great shale gas wells were drilled back all the way almost like 2000 2001 by the old mitchell energy and like i said the results have been incredible for example the u.s dry natural gas production i think bottomed in 2006 2007 a little below 50 bcf a day and literally by 1999 you had almost hit 100 bcf a day you had doubled gas production in the period of about whatever that is you know 14 years or something like that what were those years what were those years again 2006 to 2019 and you doubled gas production and of course what's interesting about the u.s gas market this has been a huge boon to the u.s consumer is the u.s gas market is is a, is a closed island is that you could import gas in you could export a little gas out but you can't export for example, LNG out, or at least you couldn't starting you know, before 2000, was it 2010, 2011, when the first LNG exportation terminal had. So if you had too much supply and not enough demand, the price had to fall so that supply and demand would fall. So what happened was is that traditionally, if you go back from the, you know, the mid-1990s all the way up to 2006, 2007, the gas price trade at its BTU equivalent with oil, which was basically somewhere between during, you know, when there's a slight gas shortage, it was getting as low as four. There was, um, it was measuring the ratio of gas to oil it was four to one, where six to one is basically the BTU equivalent. And then when, you know, there'd be uh, warm winters or something like that, more supply than demand, it would get as high as like 10, 12 to one. Well, after the shale revolution really started to roll, the gas shale revolution, that ratio got completely unhinged from its BTU equivalent. In fact, there are periods in say the mid 2000s where the ratio was 40 to one and even today it's still 20 to one i mean the u.s gas molecule is radically cheap relative to its hydrocarbon value and that's because of the shale gas revolution and same with oil shales you know the oil shales were delayed a little bit um came about 10 years after the gas shell revolution and the first successes in the Bakken and in the Eagleford and the Permian. And we had a disequilibrium in the U.S. oil market as well. So oil prices, you know, got ridiculously low. Um, so you pointed out that the technology to actually fracture or hydraulically fracture a horizontal well has been around for a little over 20 years now. However, the shell revolution didn't really take off until after, um, you know, the financial crisis. To what degree was the shell revolution a product of a change in technology which had been around for a little while versus a change in very, very low interest rates, which allowed these companies to raise debt at very low levels and plow capital into this new technology that had been around for, you know, 10 or 15 years at that point? Well, I think that was definitely part of it. But, you know, the industry was getting better and better. And so, you know, the first, really, if you go back, like Lee was saying, with Mitchell Energy ended up being Devon, um, they're the first people that, that really sort of cracked the code of, of shale on the gas side of things. And that was a really iterative process. So it just took a huge amount of time to kind of dial that in. Um, and then there was a view for a long time that shale oil would never flow because it was a much larger molecule. So I think certainly, you know, if, if you look at the industry, they outspent cash flow and there's a huge um, view that, you know, they were capital destructive uh, and, and low interest rates and debt uh, played a huge part of that. But but I think it was also the, the working their way up the learning curve uh, as well. And, and there's also, there were two, I would call them massive shale gas discoveries and discovery is not the right word because we knew that the Marcellus shale had hydrocarbons in it from going back to Colonel Drake. I mean, that's the source rock for Colonel Drake's discovery. And they figured out how to make the Marcellus gas productive starting in the like 2009, 2010. And that was a very rich shale gas play. And shale gas production from the Marcellus went from zero, say in 2010, to 2019, it went to almost over 25 BCF a day. I mean, that is absolutely incredible. That one field was representative of the 50% of the total gas supply increase over the last 10, 12 years. You know, a point I think that you have made uh, very well and, uh, and fairly recently is that this is the first time in the history of uh, energy uh, commerce that the world has chosen a less efficient means of producing energy than the one it met it is intended to displace, right? So always in the past, uh, revolutions in energy have been about uh, progress in cost and efficiency. And what is unique today is the world has chosen to embrace technologies that are demonstrably more expensive and less efficient than the ones they are about ready to nudge. This is so important and people just don't understand this. And Adam's the expert on, on this, but uh, you're exactly right, Jim. In the history of the world, a new technology that has inferior energy economics has never displaced an, an old technology. 
and we're, tr we're trying to force that on society today and it's going to cost us tremendously because the way the only there's only two ways that can happen one is that you 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 subsidize that new technology like windmills and things like that or you just outlaw the old technology you know like the ev like for example you could either subsidize it which they're trying to do in this new transportation they bill they have done and there's some wonderful stories about when you subsidize it, what it does and when you take away the subsidies what happens after that uh you either subsidize it or like what china might do they might outright outlaw the internal combustion engine. But other than that, the EV will never displace the internal combustion engine. And and that's where I think this idea of the distortions of cheap energy really come into play because you can account for the inferior energy economics and you can really see it sort of plain on paper right there. And the question is just, well, how have they been allowed to proliferate then over the last decade? How can we go so far down this path? And that's where I think the analogy to interest rates and cheap credit come into play. You know, so the last 10 years have been unique for two reasons. And the first is, um, as obviously your readers know, 4,000 year history of interest rates never been cheaper. Uh, money's never been cheaper. And the second is every source of conventional energy has fallen by 90% from peak to trough, whether it's oil or gas or coal or uranium or renewables, everything's fallen. You know, we, we're hard pressed to find a decade that has seen every primary form of energy fall peak to trough 90%. And then you take a step back and you say, well, here we've had this huge proliferation of a technology that is two things, very capital hungry and very energy hungry. And I think that the reason, when you put it in those terms, you begin to see the reason is because we've had distortive low interest rates and distortively low energy prices. Plus zero commissions from Robinhood. <laughs> uh, in your fourth quarter letter, which I recommend everyone reads, you did point out that the cost of solar had dropped like 80% of the decade into 2020. But then you dug into why did that price drop? And almost all of it was driven by the primary input of energy going down. And you pointed out that last year, polysilicon, which is kind of the primary raw component to actually make a solar panel, has gone up by, what ridiculous percentage was it? Oh, I think I think it went up by three or 400% last year. Which is a pretty big, ridiculous Huge. percentage. And you know, this is not just academic, and it's funny because when when we started the research a year, 18 months, two years ago, it was a little bit academic. And now you're starting to see some real impacts and you can see it um, if you look at polysilicon prices or now they're moving higher. And, you know, like I said, it seems difficult to see how efficiency can overcome the fact that your primary input cost is going up three to four X. Um, similarly, lithium ion batteries, which I should point out, you know, if you read Bloomberg NEF, which is new energy finance, the only question was how fast those prices could fall. It was never a question of would they go up. And sure enough, 2021, they actually went up. Bloomberg NEF uh, blames um, COVID, as so many people Weather. do. <laughs> uh, exactly, in, in, in those open air battery factories. <laughs> but you know that's likely to, to happen again in 2022. And most recently, which got no press at all, but LG just announced that, that they're actually gonna be shutting a renewables plant in the United States because their raw material costs uh, mean that it is no longer economic to generate. So for the last decade, we've had cheap and cheaper energy. And in most cases, you said it fell 90%. Um, we're recording on uh, Wednesday, March 9th. And I only say that because prices have been so volatile that your Bloomberg might show a different price later, but energy is not so cheap anymore. And in your fourth quarter letter, you're pointing out that not only has demand outsurpassed uh, supply growth over the last couple of years, but because we've invested so little, we're actually at the risk at the end of this year, and you wrote your letter before Russia invaded Ukraine, of running out of spare uh, capacity in oil in general, which I can't imagine was made easier by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, no, it, no, Evan, this is so important, and people don't don't pay any attention to this. Because demand has been so strong, and how strong has demand been? Well, we've been harping on, on this forever. If you just look at the global inventory data, you know, it just shows that demand is running much stronger than anyone would care to admit. But the IEA, uh, in their January oil market report, they revised up their 2021 estimate for global oil demand by almost 1 million barrels a day. It's the largest single revision they've ever made. And just for a sense of scale, what is global demand per day? It's about 100 million barrels a day right now. So they, they revised, they were off by a million, and they're still behind in their estimates. We would say that they've got to raise it another 500,000 barrels a day to properly account for the balances for 2021. So you got you got very, very strong demand. And the IEAs also, they fall into a trap that they fell into back in the mid 2000s, where every year they said, non-opic oil supply is gonna grow by two million, two and a half million barrels a day. And it never did. And it was before the shale revolution. And now they're saying the same thing. For example, their original estimate for non-opic oil supply for the 2022 is 3.1. We would say it's gonna be probably five to 600,000. And strong demand, that little amount of non 
OPEC supply growth, and you're going to wind up in a situation where total global oil demand is going to approach total global pumping capability in the fourth quarter of this year. And we, we've never, ever been there before, ever, not even close. How close did we get in the 70s when we actually did have, you know, lines in the pumps? That, that Some of the data is a little hard, but I think it was we had excess pumping capability in both 73 and 79 of almost 5 million barrels a day. Um, Lee and Adam, you are both uh, fearless and uh, not to mention accurate but uh, fearless in, uh, in looking into the future and squinting sometimes to be sure, but coming up with price forecasts on commodities uh, that seem outlandish until they seem rather mainstream. All right, so um, I, I wanna draw you out on your expectations for various commodities and then uh, we will conclude with uh, some ideas on how um, our listeners might uh, go about patronizing the Gearing and Rosen's white firm, um, what uh, people can think about doing to uh, uh, to profit by these trends you see. So, all right, so let's, uh, so where is it? Gasoline is uh, a four-dollar item some places, some other places a little bit less, some places a lot more. What was, this is an election year, congressional election year. Where is, where is the price of gasoline going to go? I, I still believe, and I've said this is even before what's happened with Russia, given what Evan, we we're just talking about, that we're going to bump up against total global pumping capability. We don't know what that world looks like. So the question is obviously when a system gets overloaded with demand, all sorts of crazy stuff, things happen. So is it possible that oil has a spike to $200 at some point in 2022? I would say the odds are becoming more and more favorable that that, that could very well happen. Oh, a, lot, a lot of people ask us where demand destruction begins to kick in. Right. And that's a really difficult question. Um, and you know, the, the elasticity of gasoline is, um, very, very inelastic. And, and, and so what we know in the past is when um, oil demand gets to be about 5% uh, of an economy's GDP, there tends to be um, a headwind to global economic growth or to that country's economic growth. And, and so I think using that as the you know very, very broadest of, um, of, of frameworks, you're talking about $150, $160 oil before you really start to see demand destruction. And you can obviously spike it past that. Uh, so but what would that imply for gasoline at the pump? Gosh, I think that's probably what, close to $6? Yeah, $6, I would say. M maybe to ask it a, a little bit differently. So we can predict supply a little bit better than demand. Demand's a little bit tricky, although it seems to be growing faster than at least the authorities have, uh, predict. How much of a recession do we need on a global scale to actually balance supply and demand, just where you see supply based off of today? That's what's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, if you go back and you look at COVID, we're talking about four or five million barrels a day uh, of lost demand, and, and that basically required everyone staying at home. Um, you know, so in order to get sort of half of that, you know, it's a pretty serious recession. I mean, if you just do, do a read through of, of what uh, the oil demand figures look like at the worst parts of COVID and what some of the GDP numbers were looking like and the fears thereof. I mean, it, it's pretty dramatic. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about um, agricultural prices, uh, row crops. Um, you know, Ukraine and Russia are not, not just, um, you know, um, energy hubs or producers, but they are also uh, central to uh, world fertilizer production and to grain export. So what do you see coming out of all that? There's a couple things going on on a longer term basis that have been impacting global agricultural markets. And we actually wrote a big essay about, I think it was January of 2021, so it's about a year ago now, and we titled it The Global Agricultural Crisis. And the, the reason for that is that in the last 20 years, we have ratcheted up global grain demand from growing at like 1.3% per year from like 1960 to 19, uh, 1990 to about 2.7% today. I mean, it's huge. And we've been very, very lucky. You know, we've been able to feed that huge increase in grain demand, which is coming from the emerging markets. You know, people, as you get rich, you want to eat more protein. Animal protein requires a lot more grain. The way, the way we've been able to meet that big ratcheting up of global grain demand, we just had year after year after year of almost perfect growing conditions on a global basis. Now, at some point, that's going to stop. We're going to have a a, a series of, of much more challenging weather conditions. So, and you, you've drawn global grain inventories down significantly to meet that excess demand. So we were sort of primed to really have something happen. And then the global energy crisis hit. And remember, you know, to make fertilizers, which of course is part of the reason why we've had this relentless march upward in grain yields, we just keep applying more and more fertilizer, that making fertilizers is incredibly energy dependent. I mean, making nitrogen is basically converting energy into fertilizer. 
and phosphate fertilizers as well is incredibly energy intensive. And so the, the question is, is that with these high gas prices, and remember European gas prices are still, I think at $40 an MCF, or they're $5 here, is that you're impacting global nitrogen production significantly. And China's the same way, and Russia's a big nitrogen producer as well. And so what's happened, they've curtailed production in both countries because of high gas prices, and have actually, have actually put in export restrictions on nitrogen and phosphate so we're developing a global fertilizer shortage and fertilizer prices are just through the roof. And this is before you'd think that Russia and Belarus produce almost 40% of the world's potash, which now has got huge problems on the supply side because of that. So we, we could wind up that, that in the 2022 fertilizer application season because of the energy crisis is much less than what's done traditionally. Now, it's not such a big deal with potash and phosphate because those minerals are actually stay in the ground and you can underply for a number of years and get by with it. Nitrogen evaporates out of the soil and you have to apply it every year. And here in the U.S., we usually, many farmers apply it twice during the year. And so if we begin to underapply nitrogen, either because the price is too high, you can't afford it, or second, it just isn't available, which is now beginning to happen in Europe, it's going to have an immediate impact on global grain yields. Just to follow up on that, you know, it, it's incredible just how interconnected everything really is. And we have to remind ourselves that, you know, a lot of our investors and readers and things of that nature aren't, aren't always as up on how connected everything is. But nitrogen fertilizer is basically just natural gas, uh, which is converted. Um, and so now you're shutting capacity all over the world. Yara just announced today that they're shutting more capacity. And so you have a situation where for the last number of years, you've been on this razor's edge where demand has been so strong and it's been met every year by record-breaking yields. And to get record-breaking yields this year seems almost impossible given the fact that we're just going to have such a fertilizer deficit. And so I think you know that's probably honestly one of the scariest markets of all. And that's also, we don't know about this, how it's going to play out, but you know, obviously Ukraine, the world's great breadbasket, there's talk now that they may not even get a, a planting in the spring because of all the disruption. So you know, you, it, it's interesting because it's it's been slipping into this crisis mode for, for a long time and no one's paid any attention to it. And now it's right in front of us. As in energy, people are overlaying the, the war in Ukraine as the common instigator of price action. And you two have shown through your work, very prescient work that uh, the groundwork rules was laid uh, for many years before. And you, the, the data again is your piece on, on the coming food shortages was in uh, 2021, right? Yeah, 2021. Okay, so, so row crops are um, big bull markets and conceivably um, have uh, uh, shocking upside potential or is am I being over dramatic? Uh, it's, it's hard to say now. Wheat prices are record high and wheat prices have had three major spikes in the last 50 years. One when the, you know, the great grain robbery announced by Nixon, I think that was 72, I can't remember, where Nixon unexpectedly sold a huge amount of wheat to the Russians. Um, and then again in 2006, 2007, and now today. And so wheat prices are spiking. Now the question is, do they do a spike even higher? I don't know. Uh, my gut feel is that most of the wheat has been price has been advanced, it's been incorporated in the price. Yeah, I think my commodities uh, wise man mentioned years ago that commodities, quote, don't hold expectations. <laughs> you know, stocks do, financial assets can, the narrative can sustain them, and commodities are much more, as it were, down to earth. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so we have seen a huge moves in the row crops already. That leaves us with uh, a nickel, which uh, over the course of 24 <laughs> hours, uh, went, uh, you know, up 250 percent or something like that, and then it didn't because they canceled the trades. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so uh, okay. So that brings us to the the question of this podcast. So uh, let me invite you to uh, give me give us a discreet infomercial. You guys are not only in the business of prognosticating and, and writing essays, to be sure, but you're also in the business of managing and have been for many years in the business of managing money uh, in the commodity markets. You're still doing that. Uh, uh, how are you apportioning those funds and 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 uh, what uh, entree does the public have to what you were doing? Well, I mean, the way our portfolios are structured today, obviously, we're still very, very bullish on oil and U.S. natural gas, because U.S. natural gas could very well be the next commodity market that unexpectedly develops a crisis that comes out of nowhere. Uh, so we're very, very bullish on the whole energy 
complex, which is both oil and gas, were raging bulls on uranium, and we have been for a number of years. We think that uranium prices are going to go significantly, significantly higher than where we are right now. We have about 20% of the portfolio in in uh, is it chemical? How how does it? How do you express that? Yeah. Now on the, on the producing side, it's very very difficult. Uh, there's only two real big uh, producers out there that you can invest in. One is uh, Kazataprom, which is the uh, Kazakhstan National Uranium Company. Is that Kazakhstan, Pennsylvania? Or uh, yeah. No. No. It's it's <laughs> it's uh, it's the wild Almaty, the wild west of the USSR, former USSR. Um, that went public. I'm going to take a guess back in uh, 2019. Um, it's a great company, but you do have the political risk uh-huh. of investing in <laughs> you know, Kazakhstan. Uh, but the stock is incredibly cheap. It's trading about six times earnings right Why now. Why is that? Well, it, <laughs> never mind. Okay, okay. P- political risk in a former Soviet republic? I, I'm, I'm shocked. It, and so, but you do, you have Cameco, which is another, uh, you know, that's a good producing company with very, very high quality assets. Um, and you do have two really good uh, pure play, uh, uranium plays, you know, the yellow cake that trades in London and the, the Sprott Uranium Trust that would trades here in Canada. And uh, both of them track the spot uranium price. And I would recommend those are very low risk ways to play the advancing uranium prices. So far, um, Russia has said that it will retaliate against the West sanctions against it, and it's going to limit the export of certain commodities. Do we have any clue whether uranium is going to be on that list? Because Russia is one of the big suppliers of uranium for power plants. Yeah, it, that, that's a real risk because one of the things that the West has not invested in for a whole variety of reasons is the entire uh, nuclear enrichment aspect of it. Because, you know, when you, when you mine uranium, you turn that uranium into a gas, then that gas is enriched through the enrichment, which is incredibly energy intensive. And uh, don't hold me to these numbers, but I think that something like 40 to 50 percent of uranium enrichment takes place in Russia. So. And you know, you that's the, the then the rich uranium is then put into fuel rods and then is loaded into a nuclear power plant. So that's how they would get us right there. Not the uranium itself, but the enrichment. President Putin has mentioned the possible export of nuclear warheads. <laughs> well, well, you know, but you know, th- that's no joke, Jim. That was called the what was it? The uh, megawatt, megaton to megawatt, or mega what, the megaton exchange program that took started mid early 1990s, where the U.S. agreed to buy. Uh, st- right. Yeah. Weapons grade material of which then it was brought to the West and then stepped down and turned into nuclear, in nuclear fuel. Okay. Um, that leads us to uh, we sort of t- talked a little bit about uh, base metals. Very little. Is there anything you want to say about copper or uh, you know uh, nickel or anything? Or if not, we should segue to the uh, to the precious metals. Yeah. And uh, Lee and Adam, uh, much to my initial disapproval, but then subsequently to my great admiration for their call, said that gold is um, is latent. It's not the moment. And they said this a couple of years ago. And gold has been indeed uh, singular in its lack of response to uh, the apparent uh, stimuli that have made so many of the commodity, other commodities markets move. So um, where do we stand now in gold and silver? What's, what's, your, what's your view? One of the reasons we, we decided to step back from the gold market in the summer of 2000 is the gold market did something. In the summer of 2020. Um, 2020, sorry getting all these decades mixed, mixed up. They do rush by. They do rush by, don't <laughs> they? Uh, it, that something happened in summer 2020, which has only happened a couple times since gold was really freely traded that was started basically in 1971. And that's silver, which you know, there's a belief that silver leads a really good bull market. And that's not true at all. Every, every bull market in gold starting in 1971, silver lags. And then silver lags and then after lagging and lagging and lagging, it makes a furious catch-up move. And after it makes that furious catch-up move, either the gold bull market goes through a lengthy period of consolidation or an outright bear market. And I think the way to look at it now is that the, the consolidation phase is very similar to the silver catch-up move and following consolidation period that happened in 73, 74. And uh, so Silver did, staged a furious catch-up rally uh, starting in April of 2020, finished in July or August. Gold's been correcting sideways ever since. There is a massive gold bull market in front of us, and we're on record. We, we think gold is going to go somewhere, be easily go between 10 and 12,000. And, you know, that, that uh, Forbes article, which I said to you before I came here, gold was 275, and I said it's going to hit 2,500. We got pretty close, 1,900, and you use the same type of valuation parameters, you can get 
easily get 10,000, you can get 15,000, maybe even more. So it's a huge bull market. That's it's settled for like 2,000. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the question, is, when, when, when is it going to be? Yeah. And the, the question is that I think that when the Fed begins to raise rates, gold will pull back and that will be your buying opportunity. I think that will be be the final. And if you if you really want to get down into the technical weeds, the last bottoming gold was made in August of 2000, 2018 when gold speculators went net short and gold commercials went net long on the market for the first time uh, 2001. Uh, Lee, if we just have to wait for the Fed to raise rates again, we're recording this on March 9th. I believe the Fed meets next week. Yeah. So do we just wait for seven days? I think by the time the podcast comes out, it may actually... You were, you, were well, saying, you were saying that when the Fed begins to raise rates, gold goes down? Yeah, yeah I think it will. You know, similar to what it did, again, using the... It doesn't matter that the uh, what it was uh, the, the Taylor rule would prescribe oh. a 9.55% funds rate, and it would take 38 yeah. one quarter point. Well, well, you have to wait for 38 quarter point raises for to get bullish again? Well, I, I think <laughs> I, 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 that like, it's things like the Taylor rule, which that's why gold has to be priced at $15,000 an ounce. We're so far away. And it's just that when the Fed raises rates, there'll be this knee jerk reaction from people to sell gold. And that will be the buying opportunity. Just to, just a gut feel, because I don't know when this. But what if, what if the Fed having announced that it's going to uh, raise rates not once, but several times, not 38 times, but say six or eight, what if the Fed on reconsideration decides that the world is uh, is very, very tough place and uh, we mustn't, uh, you know, you can write the speech for Chairman Powell. What happens if the Fed gives the, the big flinch? What then? That would be the time to say, okay, the correction phase is over and buy in. If gold's up $100 and the Fed says we're not going to raise rates, then you should you know, just follow it and, and buy, to the, buy to that strength. Uh, Evan has left the cat out of the bag that we're talking on March 9th. On March 9th, the oil did what, up and down $20 a barrel? Uh, I think oil's down like 20 bucks after being up 20 bucks yesterday. And gold was down uh, 3% having been up 3% yesterday. But I think it's up 3% today after being down 3% <laughs> yesterday. So, but, but, but in, in, in stocks, according, it's, it is notorious that, uh, um, maybe this is, you'll tell me whether it's, it's, this is a, a helpful piece of lore or not, but uh, uh, bear market um, uh, rallies are meant to be uh, especially ferocious and uh, and pullbacks in a bull market uh, similarly supposed to be violent. So is that uh, is it an accurate description of what happens in commodity markets? So is it should the bulls on these things be discouraged when oil pulls back uh, like 10 percent in a day? No. In fact, I think this is like you mentioned, Jim, this is a classic when a bull market starts. The pullbacks are incredibly violent and oftentimes you, you give up two thirds of the advance. And every time it's a buying opportunity. And, you know, in the webcast we did today, I said, if we wake up tomorrow and Putin withdraws from the Ukraine and the oil's down, is down 30 or 40 bucks, whatever, I said, buy as many oil stocks as you can. And that's, that's my advice. Because all the fundamentals we just talked about yeah. aren't going away. On, on the short term versus longer term, your analysis based off of kind of looking at the supply demand factors for each commodity, and in each commodity you find that we've just underinvested massively for the last decade, so prices need to go up so we can invest enough to actually meet demand. Um, along the way, we're probably going to have a few recessions, as you said, if oil gets to $160, that's the critical threshold at which economies tend to slow down. So how do you kind of temper your longer term views versus kind of the shorter term where we could very well have a global recession or a recession in North America that could lead to a temporary correction? But at the same time, I imagine that doesn't fix the longer term. We've not invested enough, even if we've temporarily suppressed demand. I'll, I'll answer that, Evan. I, I think that there's going to be a new source of demand of which absolutely no one except you in your last issue hinted upon it. There's going to be a new source of demand that absolutely it, it, no one is talking about the, the, today. And when inflationary psychology begins to grip hold and people begin to worry that first I can't buy at today's price because it'll be higher in the future or maybe I won't be able to buy it at all what do I do I go out and buy more and the, you know we, we're, we're, we've been running in a zero in time inventory system now for 20 years and we're realizing well maybe we should have a little bit more and the other thing too is remember going back to the 70s Jimmy remember what was one of the biggest sources of of corporation's profit was inventory profit. And you know it got so bad that they had to change the accounting system. We went from FIFO to LIFO to, to remove the distortion of inventory profit. It was so big. And so the question is, if I'm a company and I decide, well, you know, I like inventory profit and you know it makes sense to hold excess inventory, that's a whole nother level of demand that comes in that no one has appreciated. And so I think that, that you know the demand could 
come from this new source that we worry about recessions and things like that, but the, the demand for inventory might be massive going forward the next five years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking to uh, the principals of Gehring and Rosenzweig Associates, thinkers and doers about commodities and uh, preeminent ones in Evans, in my opinion. Um, Evans, didn't you talk to uh, Lee and Adam on your fine, fine Halliburton piece? Oh, indeed. I, 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 every time we do a commodity-focused story, I want to get at least the, the health check from them saying, A, I'm not off course, and B, it might actually work out. And if I can't get those, I don't usually proceed. Yeah, right. I feel the same way about uh, things at home. I always check with my wife. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, it's been great having you, Adam. Uh, Adam is also a, apparently a skier such that he is not afraid to ski in Switzerland. Well, they, they don't just have hills. They got mountains. <laughs> and, well, welcome back to America, Adam. And thank you for being here. Lee, thank you for being here. And thank you very much, Jim. I really enjoy being able to come over and do this. Yes, um, thank you and, so and, much. And Lee and Adam, how can we forget to give our own infomercial? Uh, Evan, Adam um, and Lee are going to be speakers at the Grants Conference on October 18th at the Plaza Hotel in New York. We do this once a year now, and um, they are, is fabulous the right word for them? I, th I think so, right? No, no disagreements around the table. So, Evan, what are they going to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something different than what they said today. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for being with us. This is Jim Grant on behalf of Current Yield, Grant's interest rate observer of the air. <laughs>